Right, are you good? So um, this presentation is called the Mouth Body Connection. It's broadly the same as the last uh, time I did it. I've just um, updated it slightly. So this is me on my third birthday uh, with my tricycle. <coughs> and actually, I had quite a traumatic birth. I was strangled by my umbilical cord and things. I've had lifelong health problems. Um, I'm deaf in one ear. I had lots of ear infections as a child, ruptured eardrums, things like that. Lots of antibiotics to do with that. Musculoskeletal problems were diagnosed when I was about five and I had seven years treatment where I had cranes over, well not cranes, but a crate over the bed and my legs had to be strapped down at night and I had special shoes and things like that. I had digestive problems probably from birth, um, lots of constipation things as a child. Hormonal problems kicked in big time about puberty. Um, I've had probably five miscarriages, three confirmed and one was I had to have surgical removal of the remains. Um, I've got an underactive thyroid gland and I've got lots of allergies and sensitivities to things. <coughs> so I, like a lot of you, I had all the usual childhood vaccines for flu um, as well and travel and then as a healthcare worker you have hepatitis B and you're, that's kind of regularly updated. And this is an extra of my mouth when I still had a lot of tea. And I had about 20 amalgam fillings and they were all done in short order when I went to dental school um, because I'd been neglected by my hometown dentist. <clears throat> and then by adulthood I'd got seven root fillings and I got multiple crowns different, of different stripes. So this is me. I did a bachelor's degree um, in dentistry at the University of London at Guy's, as was. And this is me. I worked in the NHS for a little while and then I went off to the University of Michigan did a master's degree in restorative dentistry. This is me. I had a private practice in central London. I worked for a few years when I came back from America uh, for somebody else. <coughs> um, so I had 25 years of uh, in practice and as a student in total. Uh, so amalgam is a uh, filling material we use. It's been around for 175 years. Uh, it's part half liquid mercury, half powdered metals. It comes in capsules like that with a membrane. You break the membrane and it, it's mixed together. I had 25 years exposure, but I also was exposed to a mercury spill in a surgery I worked in and I did go through some motions, but um, I didn't realise how serious that was and I carried on working in that room. And after that I became, this is all in hindsight of course, I became very ill indeed. So um, the doctors washed their hands of me. Uh, the nicest doctor I saw suggested that I took a rest. So I sold my practice, which was traumatic in itself because the sale fell through nine times. Um, and then instead of that being <coughs> the solution to my problems, I actually had a complete collapse um, when the stress was removed. And after a while, I realised that the cavalry weren't coming and that I wasn't just sick, but that I was actually dying and that nobody cared and nobody knew what to do. I started to reflect back on things. This is my father's mother um, and she died of a goiter, an untreated goiter, when she was about 42. Um, my, my father's sister, um, these are just a few family members, but uh, she had, was diagnosed with juvenile arthritis when she was three and she suffered a lot throughout her life, ended up in a wheelchair and died in her 50s. Um, and this is my niece who was diagnosed at 13 with a pituitary tumour. So every other member of my family has got a thyroid disorder uh, and we're not a very well lot. And I reflected on why we were all so sickly. Um, since obviously our genes had survived for you know thousands of years. This was just uh, this is actually after the fact, but this was just an objective measure of how sick I was at the time. Um, this is a, a, a function of um, adrenal uh, health, and uh, you can see the normal band, and you can see uh, uh, my measure. I'm just flatlining, so my whole endocrine system I think had completely collapsed. Um, I had profound insomnia, <clears throat> just didn't sleep for days at a time and then I'd get a couple of hours of fitful sleep, um, terrible diarrhoea and digestive problems, great fatigue, um, I could barely function and I was housebound for a lot of this. Anyway, it, it took me quite a while to kind of put the pieces together um, and even to consider what the, the causes might have been. But I, realising nobody was going to help, I, I did a lot of reading myself around the topic. And I, at first that was informal, and then it became uh, formal. And I did 
ultimately um, eight diplomas, including kinesiology and, and allergy therapy, and I clawed my way back to a reasonable level of health. Um, so what I realised during that process was that our bodies are self-healing and they ha always have been, um, that allopathic medicine, which is what people would call traditional medicine, is suppressive. All it does is block pathways, antibiotic, antihistamine, so on. Um, and there are three causes of illness. You're either deficient in something, you're toxic, or there's some kind of emotional or physical trauma. And the central tenet of naturopathy is that you identify and treat the cause. Um, what we call disease are healing crises, the detoxifications, and so after 40 years of doing it the uh, allopathic way, I allowed my body to do what it wanted to do after 40 years of suppression. And um, these are, well, I looked like that on and off for 10 years, um, so uh, I was fairly housebound because of that and <laughs> the diary and what have you. <clears throat> Um, and this is a horror because mercury is, uh, one, you'll find out, it's one of the most horrendous substances on earth. So um, those rashes are incredibly uh, burning, itchy, horrible. Anyway, when I figured it all out, I wrote a book um, and had that published a while ago now. Uh, and then I set up initially a website to do with um, toxic metals, essentially, and the natural recovery plan. And then as the penny dropped about dental procedures, I set up another website called Mouth, The Mouth Body Doctor and, and look, that looks into all of that. Now these websites are no longer up, but I do have all the articles. Um, so if you're interested in any articles, I've got hundreds, um, just email me and let me, I'll, I'll forget if you tell me now, but um, ask me and I'll can pop over an article on any topic you like. <coughs> So just as my book was being, has been published and then just as I was about to launch the website, I was hit by a motorbike outside my house, walking outside my house, and um, I was thrown up into the air, broke my coccyx, broke my femur, uh, and had a so-called nail put in. Lost a lot of blood, um, didn't want to have metal in my body, so I went through a whole other round of having the metal removed and losing more blood again. So that was sort of four years of my life. Um, just as I was getting better from mercury poisoning. So I'm going to hit on some points today, I don't know, there's 12 or 15 topics or something like that uh, in uh, biological dentistry. So the new paradigm is a holistic view. Albert Einstein, over 100 years ago, told us that everything is slowed down energy. There is no matter as such. And that we're energy beings. I can't remember what kind of imaging this is, but this shows that we're energy beings. And then this shows that chakras are real. You can image them. And then this is a man exploding energy out of his solar plexus. And that meridians are real too. And this is thermography. Um, I think they've stimulated the meridian in some way. And this is uh, what the Chinese have always maintained, uh, which is exactly right. Now we've got the imaging. <coughs> so each tooth is on a meridian and there's a kind of circuit, circuit between the organ, the meridian, or the organs, the meridian and the tooth. So you need to look, the tooth may be causing problems with the organ or the organ may be causing problems with the tooth. You can look these up if you look online on tooth um, meridian charts. But it's definitely worth looking at that if you get any issue. Um, so what we've done is, dentists are only really looking at the mouth, they don't know that people subsequently go on and get diseases after their treatment, and then the doctors are only looking at the rest of the body and they don't look at the mouth at all, so nobody's putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So this is a, a quote from Ryan Hardvoll, who developed electroacupuncture. Um, up to 90% of all chronic disease has an orientation in the mouth, so it may not be caused by, but there's some element at play. <coughs> So you probably all appreciate this in this room, but everything's connected. So the mouth and the uh, body are connected via the airway, via the digestive tract, the nervous system, the dura, which is the, um, the uh, taut membranes around the uh, brain and the spinal cord, uh, the muscles, the skeleton, the lymphatic system, um, the circulation, and there's planes through the tissue as well. 
So the first topic is facial growth. Uh, so when babies are young, their bones are waxy and they're easily malleable. And if you breastfeed a baby, it actually brings its jaw forward and it works its tongue against the nipple and it spreads the plates of the skull and the jaw and the face starts to develop downwards as a consequence and you get proper development of the temporomandibular joint, which is the jaw joint. So this is what you're aiming for in the adult. <coughs> and a nice wide symmetrical face. Um, you can get frenums um, that don't that are attached. I've got a still a somewhat attached lingual frenum, but if a baby has this, it just can't feed at all. So if there's a baby in great distress um, early on, you want to check for, for that and get it treated. It's just a little laser um, cut they make. Mm -hmm. Uh, so bottle feeding is completely different to breastfeeding. The baby takes the whole teat in and it sucks, it sucks its cheeks in. So that actually narrows the jaw, doesn't spread the jaw. Um, and this is to remind me to tell you that they found that dental development and brain development, the architecture of the brain and the, te the mouth are intimately connected, the development of the two. So, in the first year, you can see you've got quite a big cranium when you're born, but the face um, develops over the first year, and then much of the growth has occurred by the time the child is six, so we're not even picking these things up or treating them till after the fact, really. Um, so nine, by six, 90% of head growth and 90% of jaw growth has already occurred. So what we see in our world is lots of dental deformity, this girl's upper incisors have got trapped on the wrong side of her lip there. Um, this is just crowding um, and you know obviously the, the upper and lower jaw don't relate well to each other. This is Beth Twiddle who's a uh, gymnast I think and Jacob Rusemog. You can see that there's been growth downwards but not laterally, not sideways. And Jacob Rusemog's got a very narrow long face and she's got you know, a gummy smile. And uh, this is Freddie Mercury who I always wish I had his teeth treated. <laughs> so these are facial deformities as well. These happen in our world. Sadly, you know, lots of asymmetry, um, lots of dental anom anomalies there too. These will be syndromes involving dental and facial development. And cleft palates and cleft lips, uh, all um, problematic. So this is just a little lesson in how teeth develop in the in embryo. So uh, a bud develops, a membrane forms into a, a tooth shape, into a bell shape, and that's called the papilla. And on one side of that um, membrane are cells called odontoblasts, and they travel inwards and lay down tubular dentine. And on the other side of that membrane are ameloblasts, and they travel outwards and lay down crystalline enamel. <coughs> So that's what you end up with, and then you've got the pulp, which is the, the nerves and the blood vessels and things inside the tooth. So this is what it looks like. You've got odontoblasts, which serve as the circulation to the tooth, and then the ameloblasts are shed when the uh, <coughs> tooth uh, erupts. So this is the guy from the Pogues. I um, can't remember his name now. But, you know, that was a lot of damage to have done by however old he was there, 30 or something. So the current accepted theory of decay is that you get bacterial films on the teeth and that then um, sugar and bacteria produce, um, ferment the, the sugar, produce acids and that they uh, eat into the teeth creating decay. So that's the bacterial fermentation theory. <coughs> and the current theory of gum disease, similarly you get mature plaque, uh, the plaque attacks the supporting tissues of the tooth causes inflammation and destruction of those. Um, so in the current theory, both are topical diseases. <coughs> this chap is called Weston Price, and he was an American dentist back in the 1920s. And he had had his only son, he did a root canal on him, and the son died as a consequence of it. And he, that sent him into years of inquiry, first of all into root fillings, and then into decay, um, which he had big teams of uh, researchers working with him. Um, so he has a book which is still in print, which is life-changing, I think. And some of the pictures from his book are, he, what he did was he went around the world before 
the travel was easy. And he went to all sorts of uh, indigenous and native tribes. He took samples of their food, he took pictures of their mouths, he took moulds, all sorts of things. Um, and then he analysed it all when he got back. Um, <clears throat> so these are the before pictures. What he found was lovely symmetrical faces, nice broad arches, no tooth decay, no gum disease, and yet these people didn't have toothbrushes, didn't have dentists, didn't brush their teeth. You know, they were often covered in a film of blood, but they didn't get disease. And then what happened was that the supply boats came in, shops were set up on the islands and things, and this happened in a space of a few years that their health was completely devastated. Um, and you can see uh, the dental health just went to hell. So um, it was a dental catastrophe, but it was a health catastrophe too. So there was uh, quite a lot of deformity. You can see these jaws aren't marrying up very well anymore. And then a lot of the children got developed skeletal deformities and um, TB. So what I was always taught at dental school was that, you know, we have wisdom teeth. We don't need them anymore because thousands of years of evolution. Well, no, it, it, it happens in one generation, it's, you know, if you're not eating um, a native diet or a, an indigenous diet. So he called what he observed intercepted heredity. And he found that these native diets contained at least 10 times as many fat soluble vitamins, at least four times as many water soluble vitamins and he called, he identified something he called activator X which we now call vitamin K2 which promotes the utilisation of all the other nutrients and his conclusion was that tooth decay and gum disease are systemic deficiency diseases. So his advice was to eat real food, you can look this up online, um, he was very keen on organ meats and bone broth and things like that. Um, so just a word on this, um, you can get uh, vitamin K2 in yellow butter, things like Kerrygold, uh, yellow cheese, so gouda, if you have a little square of gouda each day, um, that'll serve your needs, um, egg yolks and liver, and then there's natto and other things. But, um, and then there's also, you can get it in supplement form, so cod liver oil and activator X, uh, high vitamin butter oil helps to promote the proper growth, um, facial growth and prevent tooth decay and gum disease in, in children and adults. And chlorella growth factor as well helps to promote proper facial growth when taken daily during childhood. So two other researchers. This man, again, American dentist, um, he was 1950s, Melvin Page. Um, he also said that tooth decay and gum disease were systemic diseases. And he did some quite elaborate research and determined that they were based on endocrine imbalance, and that that in turn was caused by the calcium phosphorus balance of the diet. And then another man a little bit later on, uh, Ralph Steinman again, another American dentist, uh, he came up with something called proteolysis collation theory, and he said that tooth decay was systemic and started from within the tooth. So what they found was that there were fluid flows in health, there were fluid flows, um, up through the dentinal tubules and out through the enamel <clears throat> and that that sheds and protects um, from bacterial ingress or acid ingress. Um, but what happens in disease is that those fluid flows reverse or don't happen and that the tooth doesn't have that protection. So this is the proteolysis collation theory that the balance of the diet, the calcium phosphorus balance of the diet actually affects the um, hypothalamus, which produces a hormone which affects the um, masseter gland, the salivary, uh, sorry, the, the salivary gland, um, and that that then produces a hormone which impacts the odontoblasts. So it's quite um, a complicated thing. But he said it was an endocrine, that decay was an endocrine disorder, and it predated degenerative illness by 10 years. So any dental decay, whatever, is an early warning sign. So this is um, regular plaque, if you like, and it's got uh, lots of little spherical uh, streptococci in and lactobacilli, which are the rods. But this is um, mature plaque, and if you look online, um, you can see real live plaque under the, the microscope, and you'll see it's a whole eco <laughs> um, thing of beating, pulsating uh, bacteria and what have you. So these are spirochetes. These can burrow into the tissues by corkscrewing. Uh, these are trichomonas, which can uh, swim, 
um, and then amoebas can squeeze through uh, cell walls and the like. So periodontal disease, this is to show you the surface area of um, the root surface area, which is broadly equivalent to the whole lower forearm. So you can have a you know, massive amount of undetected chronic disease, basically. And research has shown that uh, gum disease is highly related to the instance of strokes, heart disease, um, heart attacks, pure pregnancy out outcomes, diabetes and bronchial pneumonia, because there's a direct line to the heart and to the brain um, from the mouth. So this is two x-rays, and I don't know if you can see, but the bone in, on the adjacent teeth is actually pretty good, the bone levels, but just on one tooth um, there's bone loss, and that's on the esophagus meridian, uh, esophagus stomach meridian. And again here you can see the adjacent bone levels are pretty good, it's just one tooth that's affected, and that's on the large intestine meridian. Um, so that may be a, a presage disease in, in those things. Um, or you need to address those uh, underlying causes to sort that out. So fluoride. Um, fluoride does decrease tooth decay, um, but it's more acutely poisonous than lead, um, and a tube of toothpaste can kill a child. It's carcinogen. Uh, it shortens lifespan. It also displaces iodine in the thyroid gland, causing hypothyroidism and it accumulates in the pineal gland up to 20, 21,000 parts per million, reducing synthesis of the central nervous system antioxidant melatonin. So um, the other thing that fluoride does in excess is cause fluorosis, which is this mottling of the teeth, all these kind of chalkiness. Um, and it causes dense brittle bones, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis as well. So this is a uh, ranch in America and their horses all started ailing and they couldn't figure out why and then they realised it was because they fluoridated the water, water supply. Um, so this is a sick horse, um, sick purely because of uh, fluoridated water. So root canal fillings. <coughs> so this is the uh, idea is that when a tooth has died, either because through trauma or because decay has got into the nerve, you clean out the root canal system as best you can, you disinfect it as best you can, and then you obturate the whole thing as best you can. And you can do that in a number of ways. You can compact in these kind of points, or you can use melted gutta perca and things like that. So that's the theory. These are teeth where they've put resin into the root canal system and then uh, dissolve the rest of the tooth away. And you can see it never is how they draw, draw it or how they taught it to us. Um, there's a kind of complex interconnected system um, and sometimes there are you know, 90 degree kinks and things like that which is just almost impossible to uh, clean out and fill up. <clears throat> so this is dead um, dentine or the tubules and this is infected dentine. So um, what happens as soon as the tooth is died and the, the circulation, the odontoblasts are dead, uh, you've got something being incubated at, room t at body temperature, you've got all sorts of um, nutrients in the fluid <coughs> and yet the immune system can't get to the um, source of the uh, infection. So it's an ideal breeding ground for bacteria and as you see we've got all sorts of yeast and lactobacilli and all sorts of nasties growing in there. So Weston Price, he did some research where he took um, a tooth sample from a root-filled tooth and he implanted it into a series of rabbits and they all got exactly the same disease. So each disease was um, bacteria specific to the, the tooth. So this is just a quote from Sir William Hunter who was an anatomist and physician in 1910. Gold bridges and clowns, crowns built on diseased teeth form a veritable mausoleum of gold over a mass of sepsis to which there is no parallel in the whole realm of medicine or surgery. So this isn't news really, we've known this but ignored it for over a century. I had, uh, it was painful really, I, at first I, it took a while to realise that 
mercury amalgams might have been an issue and I had those out and as I worked along the line and then I had my metal crowns replaced with ceramics and things and then I realised that my root canals had to go and I had seven root canals so it was quite a, a big undertaking I had them all replaced with ceramic um, implants and I sent samples off to America to be DNA analysed um, so these are my results and because that's small I've put the results here. Um, so I had three teeth tested and there were 23 pathogens of which nine were at a serious risk and the, the worst tooth, uh, we put it in the wrong uh, preservative so they couldn't analyse it. But so I was carrying those teeth, carried the bacteria for diphtheria, uh, bacillus cereus, um, food poisoning, ag agricutibacter, actinomycetum comitans which causes respiratory tract infections, endocarditis and gum disease and Helicobacter pylori, which causes stomach ulcers and possibly stomach cancer, and E. coli, which causes food poisoning. So I've got a good soup of um, stuff going there. So some dentists think that if you're in robust good health, um, that things, root canals can be tolerated, and others think that it's a fatally flawed procedure and that all root filling, fillings should be removed. Um, certainly if you've got a family history of degenerative disease then it's probably a good idea to get root fillings out and just it's a fundamentally flawed thing in that um, it's like preserving a dead gallbladder or something like that you're preserving a dead organ in the body it's not a good idea and then there's also the fact that you've got a dead organ on a meridian which is probably blocking or interfering with meridian flows <coughs> so jaw cavitations this is a, another whole topic so this is a tooth and you've got a membrane which suspends the tooth in the jawbone and then you've got a dense layer of bone around that. And when we extract teeth, what we're taught to do is, you know, you try and get the whole tooth out. It doesn't always happen that way. You make sure there's blood clot um, and then you pack the patient off, etc. with instructions. The trouble is that the um, cells uh, that are needed and the blood vessels that are needed to get in, they can't get in through the membrane and the, the dense bone. So you end up with an area of osteonecrosis um, most of the time and uh, some osteomyelitis. So this is, you end up with a thin um, eggshell of bone over the top, but most extractions end up with a cavitation. So it's not obvious. Um, on x-ray or anything um, and nearly all wisdom teeth extractions because the bone there is dense and most lower molar teeth extractions also because the bone is dense there form cavitations. So I don't know if you can see here but there is this cavitation um, on the x-ray and then when you open up the gum you can see there's a small cavity in the bone and then when you open that up you can see there's a larger cavity. So the treatment here is to curette the whole thing out and get it to heal to heal properly. So another tissue, uh, scar tissue and interference fields, another whole topic. So everything in the body should flow, lymph, blood, gallbladder, everything, gall, bile. So this is showing the nerve supply to the uh, face. So there's a lot of nerve supply there. If you were to, this is called the homunculus. So this is how the body is represented to the brain. Um, so a lot of the uh, supply is to the hands and to the mouth. <coughs> so the mouth is disproportionately present, represented in, in the uh, cortex. Um, traditional orthodontics. With traditional orthodontics, what they do, probably because of the lack of full breastfeeding and everything, they look and think that uh, the mouth is crowded. So they take some teeth out and then they um, shrink the jaw um, arch down. Um, so this is typical, they take out a second premolar and, and bring everything in. So this is the result you end up with, which is a kind of collapsed lower face. Um, and this is Rebecca Adlington, who's a swimmer. She looks like she's got a big nose, but I suspect she's had traditional orthodontics, which has um, made her lower face recede. So this is the alternative to that, which is orthotropics. <coughs> so orthotropics is to promote the proper growth of the face and to expand the jaws and allow the teeth 
to fall into line. So this is the sort of results you get with that. So it's a much better um, facial result. So traditional orthodontics typically removes four to eight premolar, well, four premolar teeth, and then often you have to have the wisdom teeth out as well. So four to eight um, teeth, or, which are all organs. You've also got the whole issue of cavitations, forming, scar tissue, and interference fields. I don't explain not interference fields very well. You can get um, disruption of the uh, nervous supply um, and it can fire off. So uh, you can get an issue in the mouth, but it causes pain in the shoulder or, or vice versa or whatever. So, and it's not a field I particularly understand terribly well, but there are people who do. You've also moved teeth and organs out of their intended places. Um, when you start to move teeth about, you can get the roots can get eaten away as they're, they're moved. You're talking about metal wires and brackets again, so you can get metal allergies and, and what have you with that. There's also the expense, the trauma and the timing of it in, in your teens. And often you end up with, um, they put a, a band around the back of the teeth to stop them moving, so you're locking the plates of the jaw um, and the skull and soft tissues into restricted uh, positions. You're restricting the tongue, um, which causes snoring and sleep apnea, and you usually need lifetime retention. You have to wear a retainer at night or, or some kind of permanent retainer because it's not stable, basically. So this is um, a fat person basically lying on their back, but you can see that the tongue, actually that the yellow bit is how much fat there is in the tongue, but you can see that that's impinging on the airway. <coughs> and as you get older and as you lose posterior support, as you lose teeth, and your jaw closes up, that pushes the tongue back into the airway too. Um, and this causes things you perhaps wouldn't expect, so bed wetting, ear disease, headaches, heart disease, hypertension, and sleep apnea, which is where um, the air, airway's being um, compromised at night and people are kind of suddenly startled out of sleep. But that puts a great strain on your heart as well, and snoring. So structural issues, again, just going to touch on these. Um, basically, the skull is 28 bones held together by sutures and uh, 136 head and neck muscles. <coughs> and the jaw that goes around the brain, <coughs> which is the tough outer casing, it goes all the way down the spinal cord to the pelvis. And this is a, a, a system, there's, there's no forgiveness in this system. If there's a problem with your jaw joint, it might cause problems in your pelvis or a problem with your hips and misalignment, different leg length, something like that. It'll cause problems with your, your um, mouth, jaw. So again, topping, touching on the topic of toxic metals in dentistry, this is not totally atypical mouth. You've got a whole smorgasbord of metals there. The trouble is that they're all on um, an electro-galvanic scale and that you get electrical uh, reactions between the different metals each of these is an alloy, so you get reactions within the uh, restoration itself, but you also get reactions between restorations in the mouth. <coughs> so this is, I don't know if that's cancer or an ulcer, um, but, you know, traditionally they would, you know, probably excise that and everything, but not look at what that was next to and what that cause was. So that's either an allergy to the metal, I would suggest, or it's an electrical reaction between whatever restoration that's next to and... Uh, and other things in the mouth. And that's geographical tongue. Again, we were told these were all, you know, idiopathic. They didn't know what the cause was, but I, you would have to rule out metal toxicity, I think. And then this is lichen planus, which is also you know, idiopathic, but I, I suspect, suspect these are all um, symptoms of metal toxicity. So the, the true scale of um, metal toxicity isn't de detected by usual means. Um, urine, blood and hair analysis because these metals are tightly bound um, and they're not in circulation. And also, I, uh, kinesiology and things, uh, they use muscle testing. It doesn't even show up with muscle testing unless you uncover it using special techniques first, uh, mm -hmm. called autonomic response testing. So metals are hugely synergistic. You're talking about, you know, uh, the order of thousands um, uh, makes other po poisons worse and removing enables the body to deal with most other toxins. Uh, women's systems seem to get messed up more than men's do by this, and I think that undiagnosed, untreated metal toxicity is the definition of chronic degenerative uh, or incurable illness. 
So gold, gold's always an alloy because it's too soft on its own and this is implicated in autoimmune diseases. Um, one of the worst reactions I had while I was having all my work done was getting my gold, a gold crown out. I was absolutely, uh, I had terrible vertigo, couldn't, couldn't even get out of bed to go to the toilet or anything for days. It was very uh, dramatic reaction. And I must say, as a dentist, I quite like gold for a variety of reasons, so I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person of inserting this stuff. Um, nickel is used a lot in crowns and bridges and dentures, orthodontic wires, stainless steel crowns, which is something we use on little kids. Um, one in ten women are allergic to nickel, mostly because they've become sensitised through um, wearing jewellery. And this suppresses the immune system and leads to cancers, infectious and autoimmune diseases. Um, it also impacts fertility, causes gastrointestinal, intestinal, cardiovascular and neurological problems. Uh, low blood pressure, fibromyalgia and backache. <coughs> so this is the father of modern dentistry in 1850, G.V. Black, well, one of the fathers, um, and he developed amalgam then, which is half liquid mercury and then approximately half silver and tin, zinc, copper, um, powdered metals mixed together. This has never been safety tested. So this is a, a fairly typical mouth and this is actually a cross section of amalgam so you've got chunks of alloy and it's quite a complicated thing, uh, there's all different phases um, and reactions between all the different alloys um, but basically it never forms a solid, it's always a thick porridge um, and it actually creeps as they call it, it moves outside of the uh, cavity bounds and then bits chip off and what have you. So the average dentist is inserting one and a half kilos of mercury uh, each year and tens of millions of amalgam fillings are still being placed in the UK annually. There are issues with amalgam because um, as a metal it expands and contracts with heat and cold and it busts teeth apart um, and that's what happened to all my teeth. They all got busted apart and then the teeth died and what have you. So mercury is a liquid which vaporises at room temperature and, and pressure and elemental mercury is the second most toxic non-radioactive substance. When it's converted into its organic methyl form or whatever it's at least 100 times more toxic and has massive synergy with other metals and toxins. Organic mercury, methyl mercury is the most destructive substance on earth and the one to which most of us are exposed. And a lot of your body is bacteria, and that converts uh, elemental mercury into organic mercury, as does um, methylation in the liver, creates methyl mercury too. So this is, you can look this up online, and uh, if you look under the smoking tooth, but what they've done is they've taken extracted tooth with an amalgam filling in, um, stimulated a little bit, polished it or whatever, and then that's under black light but you can see that the um, mercury vapour is coming off um, that tooth. So in the 70s, because of the problems of busting teeth apart, uh, they introduced high copper amalgam, which is you know, less prone to uh, corrosion and things like that. But um, it releases 50 times the mercury vapour of the earlier formulations, and you can see that the mercury is beading here on the surface. So things got a whole lot worse in the 1970s. So what amalgam fillings are basically are time-release mercury implants um, and this depends on how many hot drinks you have, uh, how abrasive the food you chew is, how often you eat, whether you have chewing gum, that sort of thing, uh, how exposed you are to electromagnetic radiation using phones, mobile, mobile phones and laptops, things like that. So 50% of mercury is off-gassed out of an amalgam filling by 7 years and 80% by 20 years. So mercury vapour can pass directly into the brain from the mouth, but approximately 80% is inhaled into the lungs and then distributed around the body and it's uh, absorbed into the um, nerves and travels up to the central nervous system that way. So it compromises oxygen transport, it blocks ATP production and the mitochondrial enzymes, it suppresses the immune system and allows viruses to fl flourish, it promotes yeast growth, so things like candida, um, thrush, and, and it's absorbed into the autonomic nervous system and tracks slowly into the brain and central nervous system. 
that happens over a period of months or years so often when the symptom a symptom manifests you don't link it back to the placement of the amalgam filling or whatever happened months or years prior so this is an experiment was done um, again you can see this online if you want to um, this is a snail's um, nerve and uh, this is actually, I've chosen two stills from this, but you can see it in real time. And they introduced some mercury solution to the nerve, and within 90 seconds, the nerve is completely fried. So that's how mercury causes neuron damage on YouTube. So this is a scan of a normal brain, and this is a scan of an Alzheimer's brain. And I very much think that this is the end result of mercury tracking up through the nervous system um, over a period of decades into the, into the brain. Um, the other thing is that all the metals in your mouth act as antennae for any um, electromagnetic radiation, poison or whatever, and that stimulates them uh, too. So um, you are swallowing, um, you're inhaling mercury and you're swallowing mercury 24-7 uh, if you've got amalgam fillings. Uh, so this blocks the actions of digestive enzymes and particularly those that digest casein and gluten. I think we were discussing this earlier. It's absorbed into the extensive uh, intestinal nervous system and that disables peristalsis which is the movement of uh, food along the gut and gallbladder function. Uh, it promotes the formation of gallstones and it destroys intestinal cells causing leaky gut. So that's where um, foodstuffs can get through the, um, between cells, uh, then they've not got tight junctions. And it also promotes yeast overgrowth. Um, so, in my opinion, the evidence for mercury poisoning is everywhere and, and it's overwhelming. It's hidden in plain view, it's just nobody's looking for it. And it can cause just about any disease, depending upon the genetic predisposition of the person, their nutrition, stress, and so forth. And everyone in the developed world has some degree of mercury poisoning. Um, one of the sources of mercury is also volcanoes and things like that, so it does occur naturally. So there are emotional, mental, and psychiatric problems with mercury poisoning, especially depression. Uh, digestive and liver problems, yeast and viral infections. Uh, endocrine dysfunction because the endocrine glands get uh, destroyed, neurological problems, um, poor short-term memory, infertility and miscarriages, insomnia, feeling cold and arthritis. And this is a picture of a lady, there was a famous case of mercury poisoning in Japan in the 1950s where a factory knowingly released mercury contaminated waste um, in Minamata and they identified problems with cats and things at first, and then it went on to become a, an absolute human tragedy over time. But this, uh, you can see, looks very like arthritis, where the fingers are just completely deformed. And these are some of the instances from Minimata, but you can see uh, the hands affected again. Um, so they, you know, typically the governments kick the can down the road till most of these people are dead and they don't have to pay reparations or whatever. So there's also the issue of you acquired, um, the mother actually detoxes into her um, uh, fetus. So uh, a third, two thirds of the mother's mercury burden is transferred via the placenta and, and breast milk into her young. Um, this happens in the wild as well. Uh, something like 70% of firstborn um, dolphins die um, or are miscarried. Um, it's incorporated deep within the child's brain, causing autism, dyslexia, ADHD, all sorts of um, things like that. And it's compounded by thimerosal, which is a, a form of mercury in vaccines. So this was a, I um, don't know where I got this from now, but uh, unexplained stiff tummy at age 15 after first fillings. Type 1 diabetes 8 months after. Unexplained insomnia for 3 weeks after 10 months. Bone tumour 1 year after first root canal. Amputation of affected limb at age 21, open chest surgery for tumour metastases at 21, seasonal insomnias every year, short term memory problems, depression, wave issues, tooth hurts, already in the process of using herbs and supplements for support, found a good dentist saving up. So this is where the dentists are causing the disease, basically iatrogenesis means a, a medical profession uh, caused disease. 
So uh, this is Bruce Shelton, who's a, a medical doctor and a homeopath. Mercury amalgams are as close as you can get to the centre of the illness universe. Their use in dentistry has set us up for most of the health problems we see today. So I think whatever the issue, you have to address that. Um, so I had um, a metal allergies test done at some later stage, and I'm allergic to 13 metals, uh, of which the worst were, well, mercury and uh, uh, nickel. I did have a picture, and I, I unfortunately I lost a lot of pictures when my, my computer crashed at one stage, but I had a picture of me having intravenous phosphatidylcholine collation, and on the day I, one of the days I went to the clinic, there were two other lady dentists there having the same treatment, so I had a picture of all three of us having our collation treatment, um, but I couldn't find that. So dental implants. Um, <coughs> So the idea of a dental implant, it's where you've maybe had an absent tooth, but mostly it's a tooth that's um, been lost uh, to disease, and you replace it with a, a metal screw in the jawbone, and that can either support an individual tooth or a bridge or whatever, or it can be used to clip prostheses, um, dentures in place. So they're usually metal. Um, they do leach metal ions. Uh, they cause galvanic reactions between the other metals in the mouth and, uh, and the implant. They probably block the meridians. They cause trauma, scarring and interference fields, of course, because you're putting them into um, extraction sites, mostly. Uh, mostly of those extraction sites will be cavitation, so you're placing them into a, an area of osteonecrosis as well. You get a, a biofilm growth, because this isn't sealed from the mouth, um, and it can cause autoimmunity fatigue, immune deficiency and there is an entry route from the mouth deep within the bone. So when I had my uh, fractured and <laughs> dead teeth out, I replaced them with zirconium implants and I was kind of in the first wave uh, of these and uh, a couple of them actually failed. But this is much more um, biologically friendly to the body. Uh, so it's zirconium oxide, it's a ceramic, um, there's no galvanic currents, there's no metal ions in the tissue, it allows the meridian flows, that's a proven thing. Uh, you still get the ingress of bacteria from the mouth and you still get biofilm, biofilm growth and it's still something foreign in the body that the body could react to or promote an autoimmune reaction, but its magnitude's better probably than having the metal um, implants. So biological dentistry, it's um, dentistry that takes the health of the whole individual into consideration and it means different things to different dentists. Uh, they usually replace amalgam uh, fillings using some safety measures, but beyond that, it's very variable. And some are very highly qualified as chiropractors, homeopaths, naturopaths, and uh, things as well as being dentists. So this is what proper amalgam removal should look like. If the dentist understands how uh, toxic it is, he should be protecting the patient, he should be protecting himself and his members of staff. Um, and you should have a high volume extraction you should have a rubber dam, the patient should be given clean, clean air or oxygen, and then there's a whole load of other things to do with water cooling and what have you that they, they can employ. And they should be wearing these proper gas masks as well. Um, so this is just uh, an issue, I think um, Kerry was discussing this the other day, but you can see what ails the body from holograms in the blood, and this is a implant that was clearly perturbing this body, and that's a, a hologram in the blood, so you'll get There'll be billions or millions of these holograms in each drop of blood. And then this is, that's a, an illustration of what probably was going wrong. So this is a four-rooted tooth that's had root filling or a post put into it or whatever, and the body will tell you what the problem is. So that, my friends, is that. Wow. <laughs>